Hey, faithful listener, grab your cup of coffee and experience the Bible in a way you never have before. P40 Ministries is a podcast that goes through the Bible cover to cover. It's an awesome narrative that focuses your mind and prepares your heart for God to speak. So join your host, Jen, for a biblical podcast that's hilarious, informative, imaginative, and fun. The P40 Ministries podcast. Listen now as we go through the book of Leviticus. Hello and welcome to season three, friends and faithful listeners. This is the very first episode of season three, and I hope you guys enjoyed a nice long vacation with your families over the Christmas holiday. I was actually able to spend three whole days with my husband. That's right. Um, He was traveling so much during the month of December, but because of that, we kind of missed each other. So it was kind of exciting for him to be home as long as he was. And uh, yeah, so that was really exciting for me. And I hope you guys had a great Christmas as well. But let's jump right into season three of the P40 Ministries podcast. And let's start talking about Leviticus 1 verses 1 through 9. Now, these first few chapters of Leviticus are going to talk a lot about sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So get ready for that. (laughs) It's something that, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like to talk about. A lot of preachers shy away from. And, you know, because we're going through the Bible cover to cover on the podcast, it is not exactly something I can just shy away from. So we are going to dig in deep to sacrifices over the next couple weeks in Leviticus. So get ready for that. But also, it's going to be really interesting. I don't believe that this is something that we just shouldn't talk about anymore, because this is part of the Old Testament. And even to this day, if Jesus hadn't come, we would still be doing this. But because of Jesus's wonderful sacrifice to us, we don't have to follow this part of the law anymore. So some people are like, well, what do we have to follow in the law and what don't we have to follow? A lot of people think we don't have to follow anything in the Old Testament law anymore. Some people think we have to follow this or that. And other people think that um, we should follow all of it. (laughs) It just depends on what kind of person you are, what you were raised in. But for me, I do think that there are some things that we still should follow in the law. You know, the law has been fulfilled, but it hasn't been removed completely. So because it's not removed and because we still have it to this day, and it's because it's one of the founding things of the Bible and Jesus's story and the story that we live nowadays, and because it's still in there, I do think that there are some things that we need to learn from it and to take away from it. I don't think that it's something that we just fully should ignore and not follow anything out of. Leviticus is literally the law. I like to say that the stuff that deals with morality and the stuff that deals with treatment of other people is what we should be following in the law. However, for the rules for sacrifices, we don't have to do sacrifice anymore because of Jesus. Jesus literally paid that price for us. We don't have to do that anymore. And that's what Paul says in The New Testament, he talks about Jesus being our ultimate sacrifices. So the sacrifices in the Old Testament law don't matter to us anymore, to you and me, because it's been fulfilled already. But a lot of things, and, and this was something, I think one of the first times I ever had a guest on the podcast, I talked with my own pastor, Pastor Mike, on the podcast, and um He said that much of the Old Testament was actually repeated in the New Testament. And all the stuff repeated in the New Testament has to do with with the morality rules that we see in the Old Testament law. Pastor Mike said that, and that was like two years, I don't even know, a year and a half ago (laughs) when he was on the podcast talking about that, how the New Testament does actually mirror the Old Testament law and restates a lot of what the law has to say, but it always restates, restates the, uh, the morality issues in the Old Testament law. So the morality stuff, how we treat other people, where our hearts are with God, that is what we should still be looking at 
and thinking about to this day, maybe not following it in the exact same way as the Old Testament law, but looking at it and being like, how does this apply today? And uh, I'm giving example after example, but when my sister came on the podcast, one of the things we talked about a few months ago in Exodus was the rules for bulls. Like if you had a bull and uh, my sister was like, yeah, you know, sometimes like I live out in the middle of Farmville and, you know, I have neighbors that have bulls. And one of the, the things is like making sure that your bull is penned up. She's like, for me, that makes sense because I'm in that kind of culture. And that is an issue where I live of making sure that your bull is properly contained and is not going to go out and murder people. But say you live in a city, how would that apply to you? <laughs> well, that would apply to you by any animal that you might have that could be potentially dangerous. For example, a big dog or something like that. That's how we look at the law and consider it for ourselves. How can this apply to us? And, uh, you know, it's just, it all has to do with your own heart and the treatment that you have towards other people and also um, the love that you have for God. That can be, that's the entire law summed up. So let's go ahead and talk about Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 today. I'll be reading out of W.E.B. as I always do, because the W.E.B., for those of you who are just tuning in now, are, uh, the W.E.B. is actually public domain but it's a little bit more readable than the King James Version. So I, I really do like the W.E.B. version. So that's what I use on the podcast. But you can, of course, read out of whatever version you prefer to read out of. So let's go ahead and talk about this and once again read verses 1 through 9 today. Yahweh called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them, When any one of you offers an offering to Yahweh, you shall offer your offering of the livestock from the herd and from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without defect. He shall offer it at the door of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before Yahweh. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before Yahweh. Aaron's sons, the priests, shall present the blood and sprinkle the blood around the altar that is at the door of the tent of meeting. He shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar, lay the wood in order on the fire, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall lay the pieces, the head, and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire which is on the altar. But he shall wash its innards and its legs with water. The priest shall burn all of it on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering made by fire of a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. So this first offering that we're talking about today to God is actually a free will offering. And in fact, all of Leviticus 1 talks about free will offerings. A free will offering is something that you choose to bring to God of your own free will. This is if, you know, you committed a sin and you want atonement for that sin or just because maybe you just want to do this. It's almost like a tithe for you or something of that nature. That is when you bring a free will offering. Now this is talking specifically about a bull from your own herd of bulls. This would be if a rich person had a bunch of bulls and wanted to offer a good one to God. So for example, this bull has to be a male and it has to be without defect. Typically back in those days, the male uh, bulls would be considered to be stronger. So a male was required for this uh, free will offering, but it also had to be a bull that didn't have any defects on it. And what I mean by that was it couldn't be a lame bull. It couldn't be one that was blind or couldn't hear. It had to be a good basically perfectly healthy bull. It couldn't have any skin issues or any, you know, I, I don't know exactly what, <laughs> I don't know exactly what kind of diseases bulls get, but it couldn't have a disease, if that makes sense. It could not be uh, crippled or anything like that. It had to be a good bull. And then it had to be brought to the door 
of the tent of meeting. So in other words, this tent of meeting, it is very clear in Leviticus, has already been built. In fact, it says here in verses 1 that God spoke to Moses from the tent of meeting. This was when uh, God's presence was there at the tent of meeting and that cloud had come down on the tent of meeting that we talked about at the very end of Exodus. So this is a direct continuation from Exodus into Leviticus. God is still there. His presence is still there talking with Moses at the uh, tent of meeting. And this is when God gives the Mosaic law to Moses. So this free will offering is the first thing God talks about with Moses, and it's a bull. Also, there could be a free will offering from the flock of sheep or goats. And then also there could be a free will offering of a bird. So like a turtle dove or a pigeon. But let's just say that a man or a family, let's say a family, had a bull that was in great health and they wanted to bring it to God. And this bull they knew was going to be their free will offering because someone in their family had sinned or something like that. They bring this bull to the door of the tent of meeting and whoever is offering it, they are the ones that are actually supposed to slit the throat of that bull. It was not in the hands of the priests to do this. It says that they were supposed to lay their hands on this bull, identify with it, if that makes sense. They were supposed to almost like lay their sin on this bull and be like, wow, you know, this, this bull is about to die for me. You know, I did something wrong and this bull is going to take the punishment for me. And at that point, they would, you know, lay their hands on it, almost identify with it as an animal that was taking their place because they had done that sin. And now this animal, it was the, the animal's life was now taking that sin on itself, if that makes sense. This is all symbolism towards Jesus, by the way. The animal was now taking that person's sin and dying in that person's place. This was the purpose of sacrifice, and this was the purpose of a free will sacrifice as well. So once that man did this to this animal, you know, laid their hands on it, that man was supposed to slit this animal's throat, and it was supposed to die. And this would be something, I believe, that would be very tough to go through. And I think that was the point of animal sacrifice. Most people have a compassion towards animals, which is why we don't like to talk about animal sacrifice. And the point of this was for it to be sad, almost kind of sickening in a way, so that your sin, you, you would recognize that within yourself and be like, huh, you know, because of what I did, this innocent animal now has to die. So in a way, this was supposed to be very sickening, supposed to be very heart-wrenching. And that was the point of these sacrifices. And this would be extremely, extremely different than how people back in these days did sacrifices. Because sacrifices were extremely common in the ancient world. I I've talked about that so much already. You know, sacrifices were so common People would sacrifice to any god or goddess that they had. People would do human sacrifices. They'd do dog sacrifices, different kinds of animal sacrifices. They did all sorts of kinds of sacrifices. So this is so completely different from the time period back then, this kind of sacrifice. It'd be so, so different. I mean, what people back in those days identified with the animal, what people back in those days were like sickened, by it when they had to sacrifice of their own flock that you know they couldn't just go and capture an animal and do it that way they had to do it from their very own flock they had to raise this animal they had to take care of it they had to feed it this would be a loss this would be a huge loss to them if somebody brought this bull this this perfect bull this would be a loss because bulls were worth a lot of money back then <laughs> like i said this would be a rich man or a rich family that brought this bull to the door of the tent of meeting. And then, of course, that person who brought it, they would be the ones who would have to sacrifice it. They would be the ones who would have to 
do it themselves. They couldn't just pawn it off to the priests and forget about it. No, they'd have to do it. So like I said, this would be kind of a gut-wrenching process, especially for somebody back in these days. This would be a huge loss to them to uh, have this bull and to all of a sudden not have it. So that's what it says that, that uh, the person's supposed to do, and it's supposed to be in front of the door of the tent of meeting. I don't know um, specifically why that was supposed to be, but God, for each individual animal, puts them at a different place in the courtyard. And this was supposed to be a rule followed consistently all throughout the generations of Israel. It was supposed to be done in a very specific way for each specific animal. So that proves that this couldn't just be something willy-nilly. This couldn't be mamby-pamby, however you want to say it. This had to be done in a very specific way, in a very specific order. And this would be showing that this was very God-centered. It was not person-centered. The person couldn't come and, and do whatever they wanted and sacrifice whatever they wanted and sacrifice it in whatever way they wanted. This had to be done to the regulations of how God wanted it. Because obviously, if God is asking for it in a specific way, that's the best way to do it. We may not understand why it's done in a specific way, why a bull has to be offered in front of the tent of meeting, and the goats, for example, had to be offered on the north side of the altar. <laughs> I don't know why that would make a difference to me, but for some reason it did. And because God knows all, there is a reason for that. But, you know, these animals, when he brought them, had to be, it, it had to be of a heart for God. That was the point of this free will sacrifice that we read about in Leviticus 1. That's the point of it. Your heart had to be right with God. So my question is, what do we do nowadays that is self-centered, rather than God-centered, that we claim is for God? What do we do that's self-centered rather than actually God-centered? I mean, if you look forward in the Bible, we can see a lot of things where the Israelites just twisted all of this and got it so wrong. Even from the time of Jesus, when the Pharisees were saying they were doing all this stuff for God, but they actually weren't. They were... uh doing it for themselves, basically, and for the praise that they'd get from the people rather than, you know, from, from God, which is why they were supposed to be doing it in the first place. But we can see there how the Pharisees took things of God and made it extremely self-centered. And that's what I have to worry about with this podcast. <laughs> you know, am I doing this for me? Am I uh, looking at my numbers and thinking, oh, I'm getting more followers, or I'm losing followers, or I'm losing listeners, or whatever. Is that for me, or am I doing it for God? Because God's going to bring the listeners to this podcast, so it doesn't matter what my numbers are, and that's something I've been realizing recently, is I need to stop being so numbers-focused, and rather just focus on what I'm doing with the content of the podcast, because that is what's important. The podcast is not for me. It's for God. And so I think that that is something that we need to look at here in Leviticus chapter one and be like, well, what's the overall message to us today with these sacrifices? And I believe that message is the stuff that we do in our life. Are we doing it self-centeredly or are we doing it for God? And I decided I'm actually going to finish up Leviticus chapter one today because both the, um, both the sheep, the goats, and the birds all kind of talk about the same thing. It talks about, it needs to be from your own stock, I should say, not exactly stock, flock. There we go. It needs to be from your own flock of birds or flock of sheep or goats. And they need to be brought. They need to be sacrificed a very specific way. And uh, they need to be done with a heart for God. This is a free will offering these people back then would have been doing this for God. And this was the point of the free will sacrifices to do it as a tithe, as an offering, a free will offering, or just to do it because um, a person sinned and they, and they choose to do this. So going forward, it talks about the sheep and the goats has to be a male, has to be without defect, 
has to be killed on the north side of the altar. And then, of course, the blood would be sprinkled, which Leviticus later on talks about how the blood of the animal is actually the life of the animal. So it's, it's a symbolic gesture when Aaron and his sons, or I'm sorry, Aaron's sons, the priests, are sprinkling the blood, you know, the life of that animal around the altar. It, it's just very symbolic. And then, you know, cutting the animal into the pieces and then washing the pieces, you know, you'd remove the poop from the animal. <laughs> That'd probably help with the uh, smell so that there's not like uh, flaming poop on the altar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be a pleasant smell. But um, either way, also a very symbolic gesture to wash the animal's pieces so that, you know, excrement and dirt and everything else wasn't uh, burning. And, you know, that would be a clean animal at that point. And it's supposed to be burnt completely on the altar, burnt with fire. And then same with this, this dove, you know, for the poor people who didn't have a lot, they could bring a dove. They could bring a pigeon. You know, a pigeon would not be very hard to catch and uh, or a turtle dove or something like that. And then that one, they would bring it to the altar and they would give it to the priest at that point. This was the one where the priest would offer this animal as compared to the sheep and the goats or the bull where the, the person who brought it themselves would have to um, slit the throat of the animal. But at this point, if you brought, if, if a poor person brought a dove as a free will offering, the dove's neck would be like slit, almost with the fingernail. Kind of nasty, but that's how it was. That, 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 that. It would be divided and burnt on the altar. And it would be an offering made by fire. And every single one of them at the very, be at the very end, I'm sorry. At the very end, it says, it is a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. That's what it ends with every single time. So these offerings are a pleasant aroma. And if you think about what a pleasant aroma is, I have a candle that's being lit right now in my kitchen and uh, it's called Winter Wonderland. My friend got it for me for Christmas and it smells just like fresh baked cookies. It smells so good. Every single time I walk into my kitchen, I'm just like, ah, like what a nice smell that is. Like fresh cookies. I mean, who doesn't like the smell of fresh cookies coming out of the oven? You know, I mean, that's a, that's a pleasant aroma to us. It fills the senses. It's good for us. And even though maybe, maybe this meat cooking on the altar would not be the most pleasant aroma up there, especially as it's beginning to burn. But to God, this was a pleasing aroma. Because the person's heart who brought this free will offering was coming back to him. It wasn't the sacrifice itself that was pleasing to God. It was that person's heart who chose to bring of his own a gift to God and give it to God out of the repentance of that person's heart, out of the free will of that person's heart. And that's what God does for us nowadays. When we do something for God, even though it's small, even though it's minuscule, say it's, you know, giving something to other people or being friendly to another person or just, you know, saying sorry to God when we do something wrong and, and having that heart change, that's a pleasing aroma if you think about it because our hearts are doing something for God alone. We are coming back to God and that's what God's favorite thing is, just being close to us. And I mean, that is described all throughout scripture how much God just wants to be near us be close to us that is what Exodus was all about God wanting to be with his people and that is what the entire Bible is about with Jesus' sacrifice God wanting us to be with him and wanting us to live with him and that is what that pleasant aroma is Friends, thanks for tuning in to the first episode of season three of the P40 Ministries podcast. And if you liked this episode, if you were convicted by it, then please share it on your social media platforms. Let people know that this podcast exists. Rate it on Audible. Rate it on Spotify. Rate it on, I think, Amazon Music also has a rating system. And please rate it on Apple as well so that people can find it more easily. And that would be a, a huge blessing to the P40 Ministries podcast. 
please make sure to subscribe to the new YouTube channel. I'm going to have some more videos going up on that soon. And uh, eventually I'll get that camera. <laughs> I've been promising that. So as soon as I purchase that, which will be very, very, very soon, as soon as I purchase that, I will let you guys know, and I'm going to be working on really building up that P40 Ministries YouTube channel. I'm going to be having a giveaway for the new year as well. I just have to figure out what that is also. <laughs> uh, Christmas got to me a little bit too much. I got a little bit too relaxed, so now I have to get back into the work mode and uh, figure out all this new stuff that I'm very excited to do for the upcoming year of 2022. Friends and faithful listeners, thanks for tuning in this morning. Happy listening and God bless. <laughs>